<laughs> I think we're starting. Are we good? We're good to go. Hey, thank you for joining us today. We're going to talk here about uh, running Docker containers using Kubernetes on OpenStack. I hope that's the talk you're here for. So my name is Craig Peters. I'm a product manager at Mirantis. And I'm really happy to welcome Kit Merker to join me. Hi there. I'm Kit Merker. I'm a product manager at Google. And I work on the container engine, container registry, and Kubernetes. Yep. And I'm just going to give a very brief introduction to Kubernetes. Um, and then I'll play around with a Kubernetes cluster later running on OpenStack. So just before I get started, quick show of hands. How many people here have deployed Kubernetes in production? We got a couple. Three? OK, nice. How many of you have used Kubernetes at all, built a cluster, played around with it? Nice. How many people here have heard of Kubernetes? <laughs> oh, look at this. Look at all that. Before, I mean, before you walked into the room and we said the <laughs> word. Um, and how many, does anybody here know the, the original origin of the word Kubernetes? Does anybody know where the words come from? Greek, right? Not Patrick. You know, right there? Shout it out, man. There you go, yeah. yeah. The uh, Greek, ancient Greek word for the helmsman of a ship. Anyway, so um, like I said, I'm going to give a very brief overview. Before we get into Kubernetes, though, you sort of have to back up and say, OK, why containers? It's the hip new hype uh, in the technology space right now um, to run containers. Uh, but they actually provide a lot of benefits to you as you're running a, a, an infrastructure. You know, first of all, performance. You can spin up a container much faster than a VM. So you can tear them up and down. Uh, you can deploy containers repeatedly. They're, they're uh, sealed from an image. And you can take those and push them repeatedly to different environments and not have to worry about uh, installing bits that might fail midway through deployment. You get isolation. So if you have noisy neighbors, two containers running side by side, one of them's noisy, the other one's isolated. They can't talk, you know, they can't uh, uh, reach into each other's space or, or uh, consume each other's resources. You have, can get a consistent quality of service across your environment because you have uh, container runtimes that are working in the same, the same uh, repeatable way. And also get an accounting of what's actually running in your environment. So if you think about you've got all this infrastructure, you're running different applications, you can see everything that's running, exactly what uh, version of what code's running, which is also kind of a way of getting visibility into what's uh, running in your environment as well. But one of the most important features of containers is portability, being able to take code that you wrote, package it into a container image or a container runtime, and move it between different environments. So whether that's on an OpenStack environment, on-premises, or in a cloud provider like Amazon, uh, Google, Google Cloud Platform, DigitalOcean, being able to move that same code and not worry about like what specific machine I'm running on, what specific uh, infrastructure I'm running on, uh, I can just kind of let it run. And for enterprises and companies today, you know, being able to move between different infrastructures is really important. Uh, things change and people are migrating to cloud, people are taking things that are in cloud and moving them into on-premises for performance reasons or security reasons. Um, being able to have that choice and portability is really important. So when you think of like running your code in containers, it's fundamentally a different way of building applications than on a bare metal or a VM only style environment. Um, talking a little bit about sort of a spectrum of tools, right? So we think of Docker. The Docker project is really the packaging and, and runtime portion of the uh, container. So the, the Docker format is a great way to run, uh, uh, run a container, uh, take your code, share a kernel with a, the, the shared VM, uh, share it on Docker Hub. You can get code from other people uh, that have already pushed out images. Um, so that's kind of the Docker piece. So they've really solved the imaging, packaging, developer experience piece of getting a single container running. Uh, and you can deploy that onto your laptop, onto your server, on your cloud, and it runs kind of consistently and repeatedly. Kubernetes is the open source project that Google created last year, almost, uh, almost at our one year anniversary. Uh, the idea behind it is it's for cluster-oriented orchestration of containers, where you have multiple containers that are working together uh, that can scale up and down, where you can easily update, deploy, and not have to worry about your infrastructure, really focus on your code, where you can, uh, focus on the operations of your infrastructure, um, and also declaratively manage it. So you define you know, what you want, and Kubernetes tries to fulfill that, uh, that desire. So you're not giving it a series of instructions of do this, do that, run this here, run this there. You let the scheduler do the work, and I'm going to show a little bit of that later. And because Kubernetes is open source and we designed it to run anywhere, it really fits into you know, not just Google uh, infrastructure, but uh, any, any uh, public cloud, private cloud, on-premises, et cetera. 
And then uh, Google also offers the Container Engine, which is the uh, hosted version of Kubernetes that runs on Google infrastructure. So this, again, is a cluster-oriented service, lets you run containers. Um, you get the full power of the Google infrastructure and Google Cloud, and is powered by Kubernetes. All right, and just so, you know, as a, by way of background, you know, Google's been running containers for many, many years. Every single service that Google runs, whether it's Gmail, Search, Yahoo, Hangouts, uh, et cetera, all of it runs inside of containers. And that's run on an infrastructure, and we've recently uh, kind of shared some of the details of our internal infrastructure called Borg. And Borg is uh, the, the kind of container management infrastructure that inspired Kubernetes. And the same people that developed Borg that runs all these scale uh, services, uh, they also built and designed Kubernetes and are working on it today. So they really took the, the concepts that have driven this massive learning that uh, Google had to go through to get to the scale that, uh, that we're currently at. We're taking that and turned it into a streamlined open source project that anybody can run, even for smaller applications. Not everybody here is running a Google size infrastructure, obviously, but if, you know, for you or your customers, uh, getting those design principles in, even at a smaller scale, gives you a lot more power and gets all the benefits that I talked about earlier. And we launch two billion containers a week, which is just like an impressive number, so we just say that a lot. Um, yep. Yeah. What's two that? billion! <laughs> Hopefully we'll, uh, well, I should figure out what the, like, the decade number is. I think it would be a really big <laughs> number. Um, how, uh, Greek word for helmsman, also the root of the word governor. Uh, you know, container orchestration runs Docker containers. Actually, we recently announced uh, support, early support for rocket containers as well, but we really want to provide choice. Any container runtime that the community wants to contribute, we want to make it run in Kubernetes. Um, Multi-cloud, bare metal configurations, inspired by our internal infrastructure written in Go. Uh, really, what it comes down to is we want you to manage your applications, not the machines. And that's, that's where the Kubernetes value really comes, uh, comes in. Let's see. I want to give just a very brief overview of the concepts of Kubernetes. Most of you may have heard about these. I'm going to try and do it as uh, eloquently as I can, but I also am pressed for time. So I'm going to do my best here. So number Don't feel rushed. Oh, I know, I'm just I'm kind of joking. <laughs> so um, and I'll take questions later, too. So container, we already talked about a container. That's the single unit. Of, of runtime. We also have this concept in Kubernetes called pods. And what a pod is, is when you have containers that work together very closely, that have shared fate, they have shared life cycle, they can communicate with each other as if they're on the same network, they have the same IP address, they treat each other as local host, they work together very closely, you can put those into a pod. A lot of pods can have one container, that's fine, but it actually is very powerful to be able to have two or three or four containers where you have reusable libraries or you want to do application composition uh, and not do that earlier in your sort of build process and do it at runtime. So you can take, you know, one example we use here is like you have a content server that's serving static content and maybe you have a, a sinker service that it goes and grabs it from some data store somewhere. You put those two containers together. If either one of those pieces of the application changes, you swap out the container. You don't have to rebuild you know, an entire application. So you get that nice separation of concerns uh, and the ability to compose that application. But at the same time, they get to run together very closely with shared fate. We have this other concept of controller, the primary uh, instance of this being our replication controller. And really what a controller does is this, this fulfills that whole declarative management. So you define what your desired state is. So maybe you say, I want to have you know, five of these containers running at any given time. Uh, the controller will look and see, okay, are there five? Are there five? Are there five? If suddenly there are four because, you know, a VM went down or a hard drive got lost and so your infrastructure was impacted, uh, you know, it'll go ahead and find a new place to run it and add that. Or maybe your desired state changed. You said, instead of five, I want to have ten. It'll go find resources to spin up, uh, spin up ten. Or there's also those interesting corner cases where the VM goes away, I spin up new work, the VM comes back, and so now I've got more than I wanted. Uh, Kubernetes will actually uh, notice that state as well and spin down containers until you get the right number. So the control state is really about observing the truth, me measuring that against the desired state, and then taking action to fulfill that. It takes a huge burden off your back as an application administrator because you don't have to worry about implementing that for yourself. You can just kind of, uh, you can just kind of take advantage of it. And then we have this uh, really unique word we invented called a service. Uh, it has exactly one meaning. Uh, yeah, so in our, in our world, we have this, word, this idea of a service, which is basically a group of pods, and be able to address those pods by one, uh, by one IP address or one kind of one handle. Um, so you think of like, I have all these different pods, and any one of them can do the work. I don't want to address an individual pod or an individual container. I just want to point at like that group of pods over there, that herd. 
I just want to point at them. Service lets you do that. Uh, acts as a load balancer in front of a set of pods that can all fulfill your, your work. So when you think about sort of building stateless apps, put those into containers that all do, you know, one container replicated many times with a single pointer. We have uh, two, two more concepts I'll go over, labels and selectors, which are very closely related. So in microservice style applications, hierarchy is bad, right? You want to have all these loosely coupled services that can all talk to each other and they each do a job and then they work together to create this application, right? And so what we have in, in Kubernetes is this concept of labels, which lets you basically take a key value pair of whatever you want and you can label things in your app. And Kubernetes uses this internally to find and address different, um, different portions of the app. So like the replication controller will use labels to find the, uh, you know, sort of the control loop. So uh, you might say, okay, this, this uh, set of pods over here, these are all front end pods, these ones over here are all back end pods, or these are all part of this one application. You can use key value pairs to label things in uh, whatever way you want and describe your environment and your application in a way that the Kubernetes API can understand and, and use for addressing. And finally, the selector is the, basically the query you use to, to use the, uh, the labels. And so that's just a way of finding anything in your application uh, by labeling, which means you don't have to worry about like, which machine it's running on or anything else. You just set a query and go to it. I have about that. So would that be like a, a client would use the selector to find the right services they want to consume, or would other pods use the selector? Yeah, either, yeah. either, way. either way. Either way. Yeah, okay. that's right. All right, so that was my brief overview of Kubernetes. It's not that complicated. It's not that hard. Uh, let's see. Okay, I'm going to hand it back to Craig now, and he's going to talk about OpenStack, Murano, and Kubernetes running on OpenStack. Sure. Here Thank we go. You. So I, I'm going to start by kind of setting the stage for a little demo we're going to do, which actually shows Kubernetes running on OpenStack. And, you know, it kind of harken back to what Kit had to say about portability. So, um, you know, if, if, you, if you think about trying to use one of these systems, this is a kind of a simple example you might have. I want to set up a monitoring system that uses some simple components that I can get off the shelf, you know, some nice open source tools like Grafana or InfluxDB, but I want to do it in an HA way. I want to wire them up. I want to uh, make sure that they are always available and, you know, I want to take advantage of an orchestration engine like Kubernetes to make sure that all these connections are always available to, to the other parts of the service. So, you know, that, that's kind of a common premise that probably for all of us, that, that we need to do something like this. So we kind of have several choices. Um, one choice is to look at all the documentation for these tools and figure out how they should be connected together to uh, you know, configure literally thousands of parameters after I've installed them and then do lots of testing and figure out how to do that. Uh, so that's kind of the left column here uh, on this slide. Another choice I have is to uh, use somebody who's already packaged this kind of a thing as a pre-configured app in a hosted environment, so I'm not even running it locally, I'm kind of outsourcing all that infrastructure, and so I can point and click and go through and, and host it uh, there, which is an awesome solution, but not for every scenario. Sometimes you also need that stuff in-house. And so what we're gonna talk about here is another option, which is presented on how you can do it on OpenStack using a technology called Murano. And what Murano does is it essentially does a lot of the same kinds of things that the hosted service providers do in packaging up their applications into a kind of marketplace, but in your on-prem cloud, so you have much easier time integrating with uh, your existing infrastructure or complying with regulatory requirements or taking advantage of flexibility you need in your underlying infrastructure to serve a kind of application-specific service level agreement. So we'll take a little look there. So I want to introduce the notion of Murano a little bit here because it, it serves as the glue or the underpinnings that makes it really easy to run Kubernetes and other orchestration engines. I mean, I'll be quite frank there. You know, we're, we're, you know OpenStack is allowed to, or is, you know, is designed to run any kind of infrastructure. So it supports all kinds of PaaSs, other kinds of orchestration containers. And what we've done is we've been really lucky to be able to collaborate with Google on creating uh, an integration that shows how you can easily run Kubernetes on OpenStack. So Murano is a way to do application management in the cloud. It's a way to package up things in a uh, user-provisioned way and provide re repeatability. So it, it provides a list of uh, applications. It exposes a set of APIs that can then be consumed by automation infrastructure for things like CI/CD, And you can, you know, 
uh, you can implement really interesting use cases, like uh, when tests fail, you can automatically take snapshots. And so when the developer comes in in the morning, they can recreate that environment and do uh, debugging uh, in situ instead of having to just look at logs and figure out what happened. And so you can get the real picture of what, what happened in the cloud. So the whole idea here is to provide uh, a way for operators to create consistency in the way their applications are, are run across tenants and have a degree of control. So say, for example, when you deploy a certain application, you always want to instrument it for monitoring in a certain way. And you want to, want to automate how that monitoring is used for billing, showback, that kind of thing. So essentially, Murano does this by being an application abstraction. Uh, and it presents that as a catalog. It has an application object model, which uh, keeps track of application state. And then the uh, events, there are essentially events that occur around applications. And those uh, take advantage of the application state. And those are exposed in the UI, or you can consume them from any API endpoint. So they just extend uh, the OpenStack APIs. And the way you configure it is essentially using a domain specific language for the, those kind of event-driven workflows. And if we have time after the demo, we'll spend a little time just digging into that a little bit. It's a very powerful concept. So what I want to do is show you how you would provision a Kubernetes cluster. And this is actually kind of awkward. Excuse me while I bend over my demo. Uh, it's not exactly the ideal setup here. <laughs> That's actually not a bad idea. There's, there's a few of them here, right? I can pick one. So one of the things we introduced earlier this week, so uh, on Tuesday I was lucky enough to be invited up on stage to uh, launch the app catalog. So what we'll do is we're going to go get uh, a Dockerized application from the app catalog and configure it to, de to be deployed in my OpenStack instance here. So I can go to my packages, and I can see I have a bunch of tools here available already for p users of this tenant. Uh, but I want to add to it. I want to go get that Grafana uh, tool that I've been hearing about and see how I use that. So I'm going to go to import package, and I'm going to go find the repository and go find a list of things that I, I could use. So I'm going to go find a Murano package. And let's see. Let's go find Grafana, see if this search works. Ah, yes, I can. Uh, that would assume I know the command for that. Uh, if it were a Mac, it would be true. But actually, I'm running Oracle OS here. <laughs> Shift Control Plus. Shift ah. Control Plus. There we go. So I found Docker Grafana. Is that readable now? So in the, in the community app catalog, essentially, I could do a search. I found the, the, the artifact I want. I got a description of it. I already know what it is, so I'm going to use it. I can see who created this thing and, and get in touch with them. And interestingly, I can see what it depends on. So in, the, in this case, it's a, it's a Dockerized instance of Grafana. So it depends on either Docker or Kubernetes pod. And obviously, that's what I'm interested in showing here. Uh, but it also depends on a back-end database. Right? So in this case, this packaging of it says it's, all, it's going to use the InfluxDB. So I'm going to go ahead and just copy the package name into Horizon, paste it here, and assuming all my network setup magic that was happening while you guys came in works, it did. So now what I've got, uh, it imported a bunch of packages into my environment here, and I'm going to give them, I'm going to kind of categorize this as a, I don't know, I wish I had a monitoring category, but I don't. So I'm just going to call it databases and create. So what it's done is it's added additional packages to my my list of packages, which means, so I'm kind of looking at it as an, an administrator. I've published those now. So users who come to the catalog, they go here, and they see the list of tools that are available for them to self-deploy. So let's go and see what it's like to configure an environment to deploy Grafana. So I'm going to add this. I'm going to do a quick deploy on that. I'm going to call it, sure, let's call it Docker, Docker Grafana. And so this is a Docker container. So the Murano packaging knows that a Docker container uh, depends upon a container host, right? So 
Morano has this notion of dependencies and abstract ways to, to satisfy those dependencies. And in this case, I've got two ways to do that. I can either use the Docker standalone host, which is essentially, in this case, it's implemented as a VM that runs the Docker service, or I can run a, a Kubernetes pod. So I'm going to choose that and give the pod a name. So I'm just going to call this my Grafana pod. You can see in a previous instance I misspelled it. And that Kubernetes pod, as, as uh, Kit had so you know, quickly explained about pods, pods actually depend on the Kubernetes service itself to run. So I'm going to create a cluster for the Kubernetes service. I'm actually just going to pick the default. So the Kubernetes cluster actually has a pretty sophisticated set of configurations to make sure that this state, this declarative state of the cluster is maintained. And it <clears throat> essentially maintains its own high availability infrastructure. It's got minions and things like that. And then this packaging implements something like called gateways, which provide easy access to the internet to place to create a public IP address so you can access that API endpoint. So I'm just going to choose all the defaults there. And then I get to do my, my choose my flavor thing and make sure I can do an SSH connection to it. And I'm done with the Kubernetes the cluster. Now I'm going to finish the pod. Now I can deploy that. And there was an error. Uh oh. That's a problem. Happily, this is a baking show. <laughs> Pull one out of the oven. I pulled one out of the oven that I, uh, I baked yesterday afternoon. So <coughs> the, uh, my server is right here. So maybe a little resource constrained, and it said I, I couldn't use it. So here I've actually got a cluster already running. So let's take a look at that. So in this case, um, one of the things I actually went through really quickly uh, is that I, I had chosen to run uh, oh, I actually, that's the problem. There was some problem with the dependency to InfluxDB. I didn't ask about that. So I chose, that was the, that was the error that came up. Uh, and I'm not sure why. We'll find out why. Uh, but what I did when I configured this one is I actually chose to have the, uh, the, both the InfluxDB and Grafana run in the same pod so that they had this shared fate, right? And I chose to only have uh, one uh, cluster of that because I'm running all on my little machine here. And so what does that look like? So here I've got a topology that shows what I've got. So in this case, I've got my Grafana Docker pod that's running on a, on a v, uh, and this is actually the InfluxDB. I actually see now exactly what happened. InfluxDB didn't come down for some reason. And they're both dependent on this Kubernetes pod, which is depending on the Kubernetes service, which has various minions and gateways. And those can scale up and scale down dynamically uh, in, in this infrastructure. So you know, what we can do now is we can actually look at what Kubernetes does uh, for us on there. So should I drive since I'm sitting down? Sure, why not? I can just do a, if you want. I'll just do a Docker PS. Are you going to do uh, pseudo you Docker, Docker PS. PS? So I've got some uh, containers running here. So you know, one of the things that we talked about is Kubernetes is, is focused on maintaining the state of these things, right? Mm -hmm. So let's, uh, let's kill one of these guys and see make what this, happens. Make the screen bigger. Oh, yeah, we probably can't see it. Yeah, you can't see it. Do it again. Please. Please. Do it again. <laughs> again, again. How do I make the font bigger on this sucker? Just press up. Sorry? Yeah, Control plus? plus? No, no, just click on Oh, here we go. Hey, oh, wow. There we go. Is that readable? Yeah, can you, yeah. Well, you're going to have the same problem where it's not. I'm sorry? It's truncating your oh. table. You just need to rewrite it. Pseudo Docker. Yes. There we go. No, it's the same. All right, the important thing here, though, is look at, look at, look at the created times. We're going to just pay attention to that. Yep. So you see one of them, we did this just before the demo. We did uh, 24 minutes ago, it came to life. So do you, do you, may I? Move. Yes. <laughs> So, happy to. so Kubernetes is watching these containers. And what it's going to do is, well, let me show you. So I'm just going to kill one of these. Let's see what happens. Remember, we're control shift C. Oh, sorry. Oh, quiet. yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Control shift C. <laughs> control shift C. All right. So we're going to. Uh, we have fun. Docker kill. And kill, then kill, control kill. shift V. That's OK, it. so that's the same ID for the one that was created 24 minutes ago, right? So we're going to kill it. And then what we're going to do, let's take a look at what we got. It's not there. It's dead. Uh-oh. Hey, it came right back last time when we did it. I killed it. Oh, wait, there it is. There it is. Oh, whew. 
Okay, that was a little slow. That was demo Woo! slow. The server's uh, under some load. So you'll notice it, it brought it right back to life. And so Kubernetes is watching the, uh, I want to do this again. It was like instantaneous last time. We couldn't, uh, <laughs> let's kill another one. Yeah, it's I'm going to kill another fun. one. I'm going to kill the other one. It probably, it probably confused because you'd killed the same one. Yeah, that, yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Ready? Up. Oh. There it is. There it one is. second ago. Right? So, yeah. yeah. Um, we're, okay, hang on a second. So, do the, can I do the resize or that? Uh, because, remember the, I couldn't uh, get that. Oh, okay. The, the well, I had one other thing to show, but we're not going to. I Sorry. messed up the network. Anyway, we're, we'll, uh, do you have anything else? Or do you I, I messed up the network, and so the Cooper controller. We had a little bit of networking fail. So, do you, yeah. have, do you have anything else? I do. Okay. So, let's just take a minute to think about what, what it is we've seen, okay? So we have seen Kubernetes, which is a really sophisticated orchestration engine running on top of IIS, running on my stupid laptop, simulating a cluster of machines, right? And um, you know, essentially what we've got inside uh, OpenStack in the Murano project is a way to build an infrastructure that essentially mimics what Google Container Engine does for Google Compute, yep. right? And so, uh, I just wanted to give you a little insight into what that means. So essentially, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, packaging applications, which allows you to have some control over who can do what. And uh, so, so you as a user can create a package. And there are a whole bunch of packages now, as you saw, published up on the apps.openstack.org. Uh, and we invite you all to contribute more to them. And that's actually kind of where I want to go with the rest of the talk, is talk about how we as a community can build uh, a community of best practices around how we do this kind of container management on all kinds of infrastructure to make sure we can have reality of this portability. And, you know, Murano is just a tiny little piece of glue that makes sure that these layers can work really well together. And so from a user experience, I can just do this kind of drag and drop experience to configure very sophisticated infrastructures of clusters. And that's done because there's a little magic that happens behind the scenes. And this is some of the Murano PL, and I've got the link here, and you'll be able to get to that. That's, that's just out on GitHub, and you can see how that works. And I just wanted to walk really quickly through this thing that actually goes and does all this work to create a pod. So it, it kind of has two major parts. There's kind of the setup, and so there's a name. Obviously, it's called Create Pod. It takes some arguments, and the arguments are a contract. So what, what is there about that? So it's got a version, for example. Uh, it's got a kind. What kind of data are we doing? and metadata, and so that's stuff that's passed to this to give it context. And then uh, it declares a few things uh, about that. So essentially, you've, you've, you've now got information about what's going on there, and this is, the, this is what comes in. And then the next is to say, let's check the state of the system. Let's see if it looks like what uh, Murano thinks the, the system should look like, because it's true that Kit could have gone and done some commands to the, that cluster, that Murano wouldn't have known about. So this, there's this uh, dollar sign deploy. So it's like this deploy. It'll run that method. That's a separate method that has its own things. And what that does is that checks and sees if the cluster is in the same state that Murano thinks it's in, because it, you know, it's not tightly bound, it's loosely bound. And once it's done that, it knows what the current state is, and that's loaded into the environment. <clears throat> Resources is then a set of associated things that are a part of this package. Right? So this just lo loads those in. So for example, for Kubernetes, there's a whole bunch of scripts that come with this to do all those kube control commands right? that, that, you, that you have to do. And it automates that then for the user or for whoever's calling the API. And then finally, it does basically template search and replace. So those, those scripts have variables in them. And you've got all this context about the current application state and what data has been passed in. It uh, does search and replace and then it executes them. So this is just one example. Uh, in this case, it's just calling shell scripts to do work on the cluster. Uh, you know, Murano is very powerful infrastructure for doing all kinds of things in OpenStack, so it leverages heat, so you can have heat templates or dynamically create networks and all kinds of stuff that's also done as a part of the package to implement Kubernetes. So that's just a little peek in there. There's a lot more to learn, of course, but I wanted to give you a feeling of how straightforward it really is. So I wanted to take just a minute here to talk about future things 
Yep, we're running short. We have five minutes left. Five so. minutes. All so right. we're wrapping up the last two slides. So <clears throat> one of the things we want to do is make sure that we invite everybody to help us keep up with all the stuff that's happening in Kubernetes. You know, it's, it's a really fast-moving project. I'd say, you know, on the same order as how fast OpenStack itself is moving. And, uh, it, you know, that's a challenge. So our packages are in open source, and we invite all of you guys to help uh, learn about them and, and help contribute to them. You know, some of the things it lacks right now are really robust error handling. It's, it's kind of a first version. It's kind of a preview. I mean, Kubernetes is still in preview. This package is in the same state. Uh, one of the things you, you talked about was services. So I think it'd be really interesting because if you think about Murano as an application catalog, it's a registry of services that are available to users of the cloud. Uh, Kubernetes represents those as, you know, they're, they're services that are available as microservices and cross-registration of those things and understanding how that should work is an interesting thing. How do you handle auto-scaling of clusters from external events related to OpenStack? Uh, you know, how do you deal with multi-tenancy, multi-regions? You know, how do you deal with alternative overlay networks? And, and the, to me, actually, the most interesting thing is, you know, we, we did some experimentation and we wanted to show it, but it wasn't quite ready um, to, to share yet, is how do we, you know, at the push of a button, say, export this whole configuration and application and run it on Google Cloud Engine? Right? On Google yep. Container Engine. Yep. So I think there's a lot of great work to be done in these areas to make it awesome for all of us. So I, I, I really want to invite all of you to participate in doing that with us. And so I've got some links here for you know, obvious next steps. How, do you, how can you do this yourself in your own labs? And how can you contribute? So I hope these links are useful. And I think, do you have anything more to share before we ask for questions? No, I think we could take some questions if there's questions. Patrick. Huh? There is an open source web UI, yes. If you go to the Kubernetes project in the www folder, I think it is. Yeah. Right here? So the question was, how often is the API going to change? It's a great question. So as we've been pre 1.0, uh, it's, it's changed pretty rapidly. But we've, we're putting in place, uh, we have a you know, governance model and a deprecation policy. Um, we have, I believe it's either a one year or 18 month deprecation policy for every feature of Google Cloud Platform. Um, so we're getting much more serious about making things uh, reliable for the long term so you can take you know, good bets on the technology. But yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. Over here. Uh, can a Kubernetes pod expand across physical hosts, or does it all have to be within one single host? One pod goes to one host, yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Right here? So go ahead and talk in the microphone if you, since you're right there. So OpenStack has so OpenStack has to, uh, till now been only IS. With this, it's going into the past layer also, right? So is there going to be more uh, investment in terms of uh, not going to be any more separation between IS and platform as a service, or OpenStack is going to be all with Murano? So, so is that a question about the OpenStack Murano, project? About Murano. About Murano. Yeah. So Murano is a, a layer to facilitate the integration between OpenStack and other kinds of services. Oh, okay. So you know, it is not meant in and of itself to be a PaaS or a container orchestration engine in and of itself. It's there to facilitate other tools to do that. Yep. Other, other, questions? other questions? Yeah, go ahead. So, so when, I, when I did the, the demonstration, so that is actually a preview of Mirantis OpenStack 6.1, which is based on Juno still. Uh, that will be out in a couple of weeks. Okay. Wait, there's one at the microphone here. Uh, we have Magnum also to deploy Kubernetes. So what's the difference between Magnum and Murano? There are lots of differences between Magnum and Murano. Uh, uh, just taking Kubernetes as base. Just, ah, yeah. right. So that's actually a, a, a much more complicated subject that we don't <laughs> can't cover in a one yeah. minute question. So you can reach out to me after, and we can chat here if you want. Uh, I don't have all the answers in short. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I'll be here. Mm. A simple answer, yeah. The simple there is, an, there is a, a fairly simple answer is that 
uh, Borg has lots and lots of features that wouldn't make sense. If you read the paper, there's lots of stuff in it that wouldn't make sense in the context of an open source project. So to keep it clean, easy for people to contribute to, we wrote it in Go. We simplified and streamlined a lot of the concepts. It was just easier to kind of start from scratch. It's also like le licensing and legal issues and things like that. But it was just we had, it's the same people that, that went and built it. Never mind yeah. that it takes six months to learn how to use Borg. Yeah. Well, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> other questions? Great, thank you. All right, thanks so much. Yeah, we, we, reach out to us after. Thank you.